Hey, funny meeting you all here. Well, welcome to the window. So we're outside and you can see here, here's each of those rafter tails coming down. So we call these the tails because that's a the piece that extends beyond the wall. A couple things to notice on here. Notice the extension of that seat cut, how it comes out. Well, that's because we have rigid insulation and a drainage plane and, and rain screen and a bunch of things happening out here that are actually gonna build out the wall. So we had to plan for all that displacement of the rafter tail. The rafter tail is then sized so that the fascia here is the designated or the intentional size as an architect that I look for aesthetically. Now, at the end of the rafter tail, you have two options. You have basically what I call the square cut, which is what we have here. Notice that the square cut, the cut is actually perpendicular to the slope of the rafter. The other cut is what's called a plum cut. A plum cut is if I attach a string there and it dropped down, it would be a vertical cut on that rafter tail and this piece would extend down. Now, why would you do the, the plum cut? The most common reason for using the plum cut is if I wanted to put gutters out here. Because if I put gutters out there, then I have this vertical face that I can then attach that gutter to. If I have a slope face, it makes it a little awkward to make that gutter connection. So you really have to understand in the design phase of what is the look we're going for. Are we looking to put gutters on this house? It's always a big question to ask up front because if we just went and designed this and said, hey, we're gonna have this really cool square cut fascia out here with some really nice stuff underneath happening in the soffit. And then the homeowner says, okay, well, can we put gutters on the house? Well, we're at a little bit of a loss. Now they do make gutter systems that we can hang from the rafters and we can solve for it, but it's a far better solution if we use that plum cut when we're setting up to use gutters. Obviously in this project here, we're not using gutters. We went with the square cut. So I'm actually gonna switch places. I'm gonna jump in that window over there because we have a soffit right behind the camera that's under construction and you'll be able to see how that goes together. So catch up in one second. Hey, welcome back. Yeah, my window got a little shorter. Or I mean, I, I got a little shorter, the window got a little taller, sorry about that. But uh, you can see here, here, we have the fascia getting started to get finished. So you'll see here we have the rake board running down. So the part of the roof that runs parallel to the high wall or the gable end wall is typically called the rake. The fascia down here and this section of roof is called the eave. So the, the finished pieces that we put under here and this extension of the roof is called the soffit. So in this case here, we use the boral channel siding and we're using it as our soffit material. So you notice that it has those channels in there. We have a little bit of overhang here, about five eighths of an inch of the uh, finished face up. And notice here that the builder, Brian, he chose to have all the miters glued. So they glue those up, they wet the boards, glue those up with a, I believe it's a, a Gorilla Glue. And then um, when the painter comes to paint, he'll make a real simple cut on all that excess glue, sand it up and make it look absolutely gorgeous. But uh, you know, that's what we're looking at. And, and here you can see there's also, you can see a nice finished shot of what I'm calling that square cut. So join me, we're gonna jump over. We're gonna take a look at this on the drafting table, add some complimentary um, talk about it there. See you in a bit. Hey everybody. So welcome back to the office. We have a roof framing drawing here. We talked a little bit about it out at the job site. Let's uh, grab our trusty friend, Big Red here. And let's have that couple of these drawings that I stripped away from the construction set. This one here is a uh, simple roof eave drawing. I stripped all the notes away for clarity so that we can talk about a few things. Um, like the wall framing, you know, we, if you uh, remember that video, if you haven't, I suggest you go back and watch the wall framing video, but we'll bring that up to the roof here. So we have our triple glazed window here. We have our header here. We have our header pocket here that will get insulated later. Our double top plate here, and then our roof rafter here. 
And you notice that the roof rafter has a nice little cut in it here. It gets completed by going down here. So that's basically the outline of the roof rafter. Now keep in mind at one point in time, it's probably something like that. And we just took this section and cut it out. So, so we have that wall and then the rafter seats nice and neatly on top of this double top plate here. And to uh, provide the nomenclature, this is typically called the bird's mouth, right? So, or seat cut, I've heard it called that too. But basically it's where the rafter sits down on top of the double top plate. And then you have the extension here of the roof eave, right? In this case here, the roof eave projects, it's probably on the order of about 20 inches. I like to have my houses have some really good overhangs on there. But um, so this is that two by 12. These are 16 inches on center. So it's a little beefy, but remember this house here is on the coastal region. So it's in this 120 mile an hour wind zone. So things are a little bit ratcheted up from the norm there. We can see the ceiling joist here. It comes into that rafter and it ties our system together. So, you know, rafters typically, when the load gets applied here, two things want to happen. One, the rafter wants to bend, but it also wants to kick out, right? So if I apply that vertical load to a sloped rafter, two things happen to that rafter. It, it wants to push out and it wants to bend. So how do we resist the bending? Well, that's by going to the two by 12 member that you know, by having this dimension in here, the rafter basically works like a beam. It's just a sloped beam. But how do we handle that kind of kick out? This, this rafter wants to kick out and it wants to take this wall with it and it wants to bend that wall out. So the way we do that is, is by introducing the ceiling joist and then tying that in with a series of nails here. But basically when that rafter wants to kick out, the ceiling joist pulls it back. So it keeps the wall nice and plumb, and it keeps that rafter and this whole assembly true. Now, the other force that's being applied to roof framing is when, when the wind blows on the building here, a couple things happen. That wind gets split, goes down, and guess what? Some of it comes right up here underneath our roof eave, and it wants to take that roof, and it wants to bend it and rip it off of that top plate. So... We have this little rafter tie in there. It gets nailed into the top plate and then it gets nailed into the side of the rafter there so that as this wind tries to lift that and bend it up, we have this force basically holding that rafter down and um, stopping that roof from basically being ripped off the house. Again, 120 mile an hour wind zone. Might never see that, but nonetheless, that's what it has to be designed for. So... Let's take that detail and look at it a little bit more in detail. So I put a larger version here. This one here has a few more notes to it. But we see that double top plate. We see there's that Simpson hanger there that resists that uplift. All right? There's our seat cut that we just talked about. And then here's our rafter tail. Well, one of the interesting things about rafter tails is, is there's a couple ways to do the eave. In this case here, this is what I just call the rafter tail as opposed to a box eave where basically you bring the eave across here as flat and you box that all in. So we chose not to do that. We wanted more of this modern farmhouse look on this house. So we chose to do the rafter tail. Well, in doing the rafter tail, you come up with a couple more decisions. One, out here. We could have what's called the plumb cut on the fascia board, which is basically the board that finishes. That's the pretty board you get to look at. We saw that out on the job site when we were out there. But we could do this plumb cut, which is straight, or we can do what's called a square cut. And the square cut is nothing more than a cut that's perpendicular or 90 degrees to our rafter, right? So it's basically square to the rafter tail. Now, why would you do one over the other? Well, the square cut has somewhat of a more contemporary feel and more farmhouse feel. Um, but most importantly, when the plumb cut comes into play is if I chose to put a gutter system out here. 
Now in this house, we knew we didn't. We had those 20 inch overhangs and we're handling the water down at grade and getting rid of it. It's actually a really good site for site drainage. So we didn't need the gutter. So we ruled out the plum cut, went with the square cut. Now, the underside here is a soffit, and you saw out there we just had the beginnings of it, but we have a little channel soffit, so you get to see those nice little channels there extend down the soffit. <clears throat> and the rafter tail, we have our standing seam metal roof on top. And we have a couple other things that are happening here. We have this block. Now, that block of wood, again, because of the wind zone that we're in, that block of wood is to keep these rafters from overturning, right? They want to turn um, either, either way with the siding. So we need to put basically these blocks in between the rafters. So in plan, you'd have these rafters. The wall would be here. We'd have that overhang. These blocks go inside there. And they keep these rafters true. And they keep them from trying to turn away. So it gives you a nice stiff system. That, of course, is tied into the wall, tied into the Simpson hanger, you know, so that it works kind of as a complementary system, rafter, wall, hanger, block. It's all working together so that when the wind blows, it's not up to just the rafters to fight the battle. It leans on the walls. The walls use the roof diaphragm. So there's a bunch of things that are at play that, you know, would certainly be a deeper dive than what we're going to go into today here. But a couple other things. You know, we talked about control layers earlier in, in one of the, the first videos there. If you haven't seen that, I encourage you to go back. Um, so if we take a look at this, obviously we have the nice big overhang. So any water that hits our roof, it's going to come down. It's going to come off the end here and it's going to drip a good distance away from the house. So that keeps our wall nice and dry. If you notice here, we have a nice space in our wall here. You know, this is set up to be a rain screen, and we're going to take a really deep dive into that. I have some upcoming videos where we're going to talk about the wall assembly specifically um, there. Our, our soffit here, now we're going to insulate this whole cavity, and this is going to be an unvented uh, roof system. So you notice there is no provision for a vent here in the roof. Um, and, you know, my, my rule of thumb is vent until I can't vent and you know, in this particular house, we're using the conditioned attic space to run a lot of our ductwork and utilities up there. So we made the choice to do it as an unvented roof assembly. Um, so that'll all, all get insulated. The wall obviously gets insulated there. But, um, but that's pretty much the roof framing. You know, like I said, we, we saw it out there on a job site. Um, here you, you have it in, in the drawing we have our roof sheathing, our standing seam metal metal roof that's going in there. We can talk about that a little later. We have our nice square cut, gives us nice that modern feel. But we have this nice big overhang here, which, you know, a lot of people talk about water management. I placed a lot of emphasis on it on early on in the uh, control layer video. You know, water, number one killer of buildings. So, you know, by putting this big overhang on this house it's basically like putting an umbrella over the house and the more water I can keep off of the wall then the less work the wall has to do in drying out and keeping water from penetrating inside the wall so you know just as the, the wall rafter roof sheathing blocking all works kind of in concert well we want our water management and our airtight management and um, vapor management and thermal management all to work in concert with each other, right? So we wanted to put that package together so things are working in a very intentional, coherent, but most importantly, a continuous fashion. So, so that's roof framing. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, you know, I have some very good colleagues that are putting out some videos on the Build Show Network, Brent, Jake, Wade, Matt. I encourage you to... Uh, not only go and watch the ones that you haven't watched that I've uh, done, but uh, I encourage you to get out there and watch the videos that those guys are putting up. I watch them regularly, and uh, they're putting out some great stuff. So look for me on the future. Um, we'll be putting up some more videos here on the Build Show. Thanks for joining me today. Um, if you want to find me almost daily, you can find me at Stephen Basic Architect on Instagram. 
as I post a lot of these details and explanations, and you can get a little bit more education there as we all uh, try to get better at this thing we call building. So until next time, look for me on the Build Show Network and uh, long live our buildings.